So welcome everyone to our Monash Cybersecurity Seminar. So today we are privileged to welcome Shai Halevi, and who will talk about private computing on blo public blockchains. So Shai, as you might all know, is a very well-known figure in our field of cryptography. So he is currently a research fellow at Algorand Foundation, and he is also a fellow and a vice president of the IECR and the recipient of the 2017 ACM SIGSA Outstanding Innovation Award and also several best paper works. And he has obtained his PhD from MIT in 1997. And as you might all know, he is well known in, for his works on homomorphic encryption and fully homomorphic encryption. And particularly his research focus is on advanced cryptographic techniques like homomorphic encryption, cryptographic uh, code of station and secure computation. And he is also the, one of the authors of this Helib library, which is used for homomorphic encryption. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I will let Shai continue. Thank you. Um, uh, I can't hear you, Shai. Is this better? Ah, yeah, much better, yeah. Okay. And it's, it's not full screen at the moment, your slides. Oh, it's not full screen, so um, then that means that I'm not sharing the right screen. Let me try again then. Yeah, all good now. Thanks. Okay. Hi. So yeah, I'll talk about private computing on public blockchains. Um, this is based on sequence of works that we did um, over the last year or so. Uh, one of them was presented in TCC a couple of weeks ago, and the other two are newer. And I'm going to spend a lot of the time, maybe half of the time, to introduce, you know, problem that we're dealing with, what is the issue, what are the tools, and then I'm just going to go over the um, results of these three works and sort of relatively uh, quickly uh, and just explain how they come about and, and how they are used. Um, so a blockchain. A blockchain is many different things to uh, many different people. It sort of depends on what part of it you're uh, dealing with. Uh, and in our case, what we care about is the blockchain as a computing platform. So a public blockchain uh, is just a distributed network of potentially many nodes. Uh, how many? Well, we don't know, but we want to have a design that scales for thousands of nodes or maybe even millions of nodes. We want to be able to maintain an, uh, a system of that magnitude. Uh, the nodes in this their job is to continuously decide on things. These things are typically called transactions and uh, the decisions are made by consensus and then they're published in blocks and are visible to all. And increasingly the validity of whether a transaction should be in the block or not, whether it's uh, you know, satisfy the rules, uh, involve running some code and that code is typically called the smart contracts. And the thing about public blockchains is that the, pub, the contract is executed publicly and the results are agreed by all. Okay, so for us, we care about the computing aspect of it. So in particular, we do not care in this talk about things like cryptocurrencies. For us, this is just some external mechanism to uh, incentivize nodes to participate in the system uh, and we assume that it exists and that nodes want to participate in the system. We don't care about the consensus protocol itself, we just assume that we have a broadcast channel available for us. Uh, we don't care about implementation issues, we don't care about data structures, we don't care about that, we don't even care about the chain and the blocks. 
Uh, for us, in this talk, a blockchain is nothing but a large distributed system with a broadcast channel. Moreover, only a broadcast channel. If you want to say something, you have to broadcast it for everybody to hear. That's the system that we care about. And from now on, all I'm going to say is just assuming a large system uh, that has only a broadcast channel. Uh, what do we want? We want to use that system with all these nodes that are running and computing stuff as a computing platform. And for us cryptographers, a computing tr trust form is nothing but a trusted third party. Uh, so we have clients, the clients want to compute something, they're going to send their input, which might be secret or not, to this trusted party, you will tell it what they want to compute, the trusted party will compute it, announce to everybody the results, and the input will remain hidden. This is the functionality that we want to get. Uh, can we do that today with public blockchains? The answer is not really. Blockchains today, because of this public execution model, are great for integrity, agreement, immutability, properties like that. But if you want to deal with secrecy, secrecy is harder, and this is the focus of, of uh, these works that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, the adversarial model. So what is the security features that we want, and how do we think of the adversary? So as I said, a blockchain is just a network of many nodes. Most of these nodes are honest. However, the dishon there is some amount, some uh, number of nodes that are not honest, that are adversarial, and they can change. They're not fixed. So one day it's these uh, nodes are compromised, the next day the other nodes are compromised. So any node throughout the lifetime of its participation in the system uh, can be honest, then can be compromised, so it becomes dishonest and controlled by the adversary. Later it recovers and becomes honest again, etc. So the adversary that we think about is mobile. Uh, what these honest nodes mean could be many things. So you can think of sales stop, like denial of service attack type thing. You can think of a leaky node that follows the protocol, but the attacker knows all of their secrets. Uh, for us, in this thing, I will talk about this worst case scenario where the node that's controlled by the adversary is malicious. So it can arbitrarily deviate from the protocol. It can do whatever it wants. What do we want? What we want is for these nodes to come together in order to compute things. And importantly, uh, we want scalable computation. The computation should not increase in complexity as more nodes join the network. Um, and for us, complexity is just the broadcast bandwidth. This is the most expensive part of the system, the fact that everything has to be broadcast. So we want to make sure that the computation can be done without a lot of broadcast. Uh, and again, because uh, we want to have a scalable design that can withstand no matter how many nodes are, uh, uh, come to the system, uh, then it's very important that for us to do scalable computation. And the way that we're going to do that is just to let a small committee do the actual work. So in every step of the uh, execution, uh, there would be some mechanism to choose a random committee and that random committee will do the work on behalf of the entire network. Uh, the committee is chosen at random, which means that it's a good representation of the entire system with high probability. And in particular, because we assume that most nodes are honest, then with very high probability, also most nodes on the committee are going to be honest. So this is the approach that we are taking. Uh, and here is the main technical challenge that we're facing when we try uh, to work in this environment and keep uh, and get a scalable computation. So we assume that there is some fraction of the nodes that could be adversarial and just uh, let's think of, uh, of the fraction being 25%. And moreover, these are chosen adaptively by the adversary and can change from one round to the next. Now, I said that for scalability, we want communication to be done only by a small committee. There are only uh, a small number of parties that need to talk. Uh, in particular, because we want it to be scalable, then that committee shouldn't grow as we have many nodes in the system. So eventually, if we really have enough nodes in the system, that committee consists of less than an F fraction of the nodes. But that means that the adversary has corruption budget, which is large enough for all of them. So if the adversary knows who the committee is, well, then it can just corrupt them all. And from that point on, the adversary controls everything. 
so what we want is to try to hide that committee from the adversary. We want to, the committee to do its job without the adversary ever learning who it is. Um, and that's even if some of the committee members themselves belong to the adversary and using only a public broadcast channel where if you ever say anything, everybody knows that you said it. The question is how to do that. And this is the main challenge uh, in this line of work. For the rest of the talk, what I'm going to do is this. first I'm going to introduce the style of protocol that we're going to be using for solving this main challenge. And we call it YOSO protocols, which stands for you only speak once. So I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, I'm gonna show you a few examples of protocols that you all know that already have that flavor. Uh, in particular, the leader election in uh, Bitcoin, according to Nakamoto consensus, is already that type of a protocol. And similarly, the leader election in Algorand that uses cryptographic sortition is also uh, has the same uh, flavor. And then I'm going to show you that YOSO protocols, protocols of that form, uh, you can have them to compute an arbitrary function. Uh, I'm going to talk about the most important tool in making it work, which is sort of I call it target anonymous communication channels. I'm not going to define it. I'm just going to explain what is it that I want to get. And then I'm going to go to the three works that I mentioned before. First, I'm going to show you how to use these techniques to just share a secret over some big um, system like that. Then I'm going to talk about doing more than just sharing a secret, computing arbitrary functions on secrets. And then some kind of a bootstrapping type thing where I use the step two in order to improve everything. Uh, so let's start. Yoso protocols, the philosophy behind them is that we have this big system and all the nodes are equal, at least in the eyes of the adversary. There are no nodes that have special roles. Uh, so until a node sends a message, the adversary cannot tell it from any other node. It doesn't know if that node is doing something now or just sitting and waiting. Um, what a node can do is it can monitor the communication there. Everybody has this access to the broadcast channel and you can just look at what's happening there and you can do local work. Uh, and then as part of it, you will learn whether or not you're on the, on the committee. And if you are on the committee, then there are some tasks that you need to do on this committee. But the adversary doesn't know that you're in committee. Uh, what the adversary knows is when you speak. Uh, this is when it learns that you had something to say. Um, and if you want to make sure that the committee is anonymous, it means that the node can only send a single broadcast message after it finished everything that it has to do and erased all of the secret. So we call it the YOSO model for you only speak once because in these protocols, you only speak once. Uh, maybe you'll speak later on in the, pro in, in the uh, protocol in some future steps, but you don't keep any secrets from this in invocation to the next. Uh, so let's see some examples. And the most known example, the best known example uh, is the, the leader election in Bitcoin, which is part of the Nakamoto consensus protocol. Uh, and the way that works is at every step, there is some moderately hard puzzle that's announced publicly in some ways, and then nodes locally try to solve that puzzle. And a node is elected the leader if it has a solution. So it's very easy for a node to do local work, determine whether or not it's a leader, right? If I have a solution that I'm a leader, and then I can broadcast this, the, the solution and everybody knows that I'm a leader. And together with the solution, I will also broadcast everything else that I need to do uh, as a leader, like choose the transaction, announce the next puzzle, whatever it is that I need to do. Uh, of course, there is an issue here because I mean, many different nodes could come up the solution and there is some another mechanism to break ties that I'm going to ignore. Uh, one thing to notice is that um, you don't have to choose just a single leader. You can use the exact same mechanism to select a committee. You can dial the, hard, the difficulty of the puzzle uh, and then make everybody who solves the puzzle be a committee member. Uh, and then you can get committees of different sizes depending on how hard the puzzle is. So this is one example. The other example is the leader election in Algorand that uses this notion of cryptographic sortitions. Uh, and the cryptographic tool that underlying it is a verifiable random function. So I'm going to spend one slide talking about it. 
Uh, the refinable random function let nodes choose pseudo-random numbers in such a way that ahead of time, nobody can guess the number. But after the fact, I can prove to everybody that the number that I said I got is really the only number that I could have gotten. If there's only one number that I couldn't have gotten, uh, even though it was pseudo-random ahead of time. Uh, very, very roughly speaking, the way this is implemented, uh, it relies on public key infrastructure. So nodes have a public key and a secret key. Uh, everybody knows everybody else's public key. Uh, and this is a public key and a secret key for a unique signature scheme. That means that for every message M and any public key PK, there's a single value of the signature that will pass the verification. Uh, and if we have something like that, then if there is a public message M that everybody agrees on, the way for me to compute this pseudo-random function, this pseudo-random uh, value, is I'm gonna sign the message and then hash the signature and the message uh, to get the number. Well, if I think of this hash as a random oracle, then uh, the, the value, since the signature is unpredictable, then the output of the hash is going to be pseudo-random. Uh, so if I only show you the, run, the, the R, then you will uh, not be able to distinguish it from random. But if I also show you sigma, then that's a proof that the value that I show you is correct. Since it's a unique signature scheme, it means that this R is the only one that I could get for that message M. And everybody can check that by verifying the signature and then recomputing the hash. So with that tool, I can use it for leader election as follows. Uh, in every step, uh, instead of the puzzle that we had before, now we have a message M that's broadcast. Um, and each node among the population of big N nodes compute this pseudo-random uh, value R and interpret it as, as a value between zero and one. And a node is elected leader if its number is, let's say, less than one over N. Uh, so you have expected of one leader per step in this way. Uh, and then if I want to um, uh, prove to everybody that I'm the leader, then I, all I need to do is to uh, broadcast my R and the proof that this is the right R. And then everybody can check that it's really the right R and it's really less than one over N. So therefore I'm a leader. And <clears throat> as before, together with this proof that I'm a leader, I'm also going to broadcast all the other things that I needed to do, like transactions, the message that's going to be used in the next uh, phase, et cetera, et cetera. And again, if there are more than one leader, I can break ties. For example, I can take the smallest R as, as my mechanism for breaking ties. And as before, we can use the same mechanism to select a committee, not just a single leader, by just changing the threshold, right? If the threshold is C over N instead of one over N, then I expect to have C members of the committee in every step. So this is a way to choose leaders. You can do it with either with puzzles or with sortitions. Uh, but both of these uh, protocols that I showed you are example of public roles. And by that, I mean that whether or not I'm a leader is, doesn't depend on any secret information that I should receive from others. Uh, so that makes self-selection very easy. I just do something and that something by itself would tell me uh, whether I'm a leader or not. But sometimes we also need the secret state roles, and those are roles that depends on some secret communication that I, re I received. And in our case, where we want to compute on secret information, there would be some representation of that secret information shared by the committee, and the committees will need to pass that information from one committee to the next. So if I'm a member of the next committee, there is some secret information that I need to get in order to be able to do my job. Uh, and for roles that are, have this secret state flavor, uh, self-selection doesn't seem to work because, well, you know, if I'm anonymous until I speak, then nobody knows that I'm on the next committee, so nobody can send me anything. How can anybody send me anything if they don't know that I'm on, I need to get anything? So that's the challenge that, we need to, that we're facing now. Uh, and the main tool that we use in order to uh, deal with that challenge is this concept of target anonymous channel. So imagine that we had this communication infrastructure um, that has these channels, there's N visible ports that anybody can send message on and N hidden output ports correlated, co corresponding to them. And then a random assignment of the output ports to some subset of the big N nodes. 
Uh, so now, if we had channels like that, then anyone can send a message on the IF input port and without even knowing who will receive the message. And the receiver will have uh, this uh, uh, secret state role. So if somebody wants to pass a secret state to receiver number five, they're going to send it on port number five and somebody will get it. Um, and the way to do that, you know, you can uh, post, you can send the, an encrypted message uh, over these channels and then the recipient will, uh, the, the right person will get it. Uh, let me give a few more details. Uh, how, do you co how do you construct something that looks like these target anonymous channels? Uh, so again, we assume PKI, so every node has a known public key and the tool that uh, will allow us to get the anonymity is anonymous public key encryption. Anonymous public key encryption is just a regular public key encryption scheme uh, with the additional property that if you see two public keys and a ciphertext that was encrypted under one of them, it's hard to tell which one. So using these tools, here is how I'm going to establish a channel that leads to some node NI with, uh, and everybody can send them uh, on it without knowing who NI is. I'm going to choose an ephemeral key pair, uh, public and a secret key, and encrypt the secret key under the long-term public key of NI. Part that the long-term public key is the uh, part of the PKI. So I'm going to get a ciphertext, which is an encryption of the ephemeral secret key under the long-term public key. And that encryption is using anonymous public key encryption. So if I show everybody the ciphertext, that doesn't say which public key was used to generate it. And in particular, it doesn't betray the identity of NI. And then I'm going to broadcast the pair, uh, the ephemeral public key PK prime and the ciphertext that encrypts the corresponding secret key. And now that this pair was broadcast, anybody can encrypt and broadcast messages under PK prime. And NI that can decrypt the, the corresponding ciphertext is the, or the only one who will know, will have access to the corresponding ephemeral secret key, and then it can decrypt the message. So this is how you establish a channel leading to node NI, uh, but there is still a missing piece here. I mean, somebody needs to do that. Uh, who's gonna choose NI and do all of this work? Note that the choices that we make here should be hidden from the adversary. So how do we do that? Um, and for that, uh, we use a second committee. We use a nominating committee whose job it is to do those, to establish these channels. Now, the work in this committee, the, which is the, the steps that I showed in the previous slide, this work that is, is a public, um, public state roles. I mean, I didn't need any prior knowledge other than the public keys of everybody in order to do this job. So uh, this committee can self-select because it's public state roles. Uh, and then each nominator, N sub J, chooses a random nominee N sub I from among the big N parties and establish a target anonymous channel to it, just like we said before. Uh, and then I will broadcast the corresponding ciphertext and, and public key to everybody to use and everybody can use it. So this is how we uh, go about establishing these channels. Uh, let me spend some time to talk about the resilience property of this construction. So we have two phases here. There is the uh, nomination, and then there is the committee that's actually going to hold the, the secrets. Uh, now think of what happens uh, if the nominator is adversarial. Well, an, an adversarial nominators can always nominate themselves or their friend, their adversarial friends uh, to be on the secret sharing committee. So if the adversary controls something like an F fractions of the nodes, then since the node self-select at random to the nomination committee, then we expect about an F fraction of the nominators uh, to be corrupted. Uh, and then the adversarial nominators will choose adversarial nominees and the honest nominators, well, they're gonna choose random nominees. So again, these nominees will also with some probability F uh, be adversarial, uh, which means that the chosen committee will have roughly a two F fraction of this honest node. So if we want this committee, the nominated committee, the final committee that actually holds secrets, to have an honest majority, then we need to ensure 
that the adversary controls not more than about a quarter of the nodes. Uh, more accurately, anything less than 0 0.29, you can still uh, get by because there are second order terms there. Uh, so this is less than ideal because, you know, we started from uh, a system where the adversary control only a quarter and the only thing we can ensure are the committees are honest majority, but we can't, we lost some sort of a factor of two. One point about this honest versus dishonest nomination is that in crypto, usually when we are in the, facing uh, the, the situation where uh, we want to ensure that some task is done honestly, then we just slap on it as zero knowledge proofs and the nominators just prove that they behaved honestly. But that thing doesn't work here because if I'm a corrupted nominator, then okay, maybe you forced me to honestly select a nominee at random using a verifiable random function or something like that. Okay, so I choose the nomination, the nominee at random, but once it's chosen, well, now I know who it is. So the adversary knows who then this guy is before it started doing its job. The adversary can just turn around and corrupt it right then and then. So that doesn't help at all uh, in, uh, in this double dipping problem that we had, because you still, the, the part is nominated by the adversarial nominate, nominee, nominators uh, will be corrupted whether or not the nominators are forced to uh, act properly. Uh, the other problem with this is that the, these proofs are long, have long statement. I mean, the statement that we want to prove is that there exists some nominee such that the thing that I broadcast is an encrypted under the publicly of that nominee of the secret key, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in particular, it's a statement of size N. So producing the proof is very costly. Even though there are cryptographic techniques that allow you to prove long statement with short proofs, producing them is expensive. Uh, we will show towards the end of this talk a better way of improving resilience that doesn't need long proofs and does, uh, doesn't need long statement and, and get you uh, op op almost optimal uh, parameters. Okay, so now that we discussed all of that, let me just go over the three steps that I said. Uh, well, the first step is just keeping a secret on a public blockchain. So imagine the following scenarios. We have a client of the blockchain and it deposits a secret uh, to be revealed only when the time is right or more generally to be used only in a prescribed manner. Uh, so think of a puzzle. I'm a client of the blockchain. I publish some puzzle uh, and I'm going to deposit the solution to that puzzle with the blockchain and I'm going to tell the blockchain, well, if nobody finds the solution by next week, please publish it. Uh, so this is the type of application that we want. The only thing that we want the blockchain to do is to keep this secret for a while and then publish it later on. Uh, and if you can do that, then that forms the basis for many interesting applications, as I will touch on later on in this uh, presentation. Uh, the tool that we're going to use is a proactive secret sharing. I also hinted uh, on it throughout the uh, presentation so far. Uh, so I'm going to use secret sharing to share this uh, secret S among N parties using Shamir secret sharing in such a way that every subset control, uh, of more than half of the committee can recover S, but every subset of less than a half has no information about what S is. Uh, we're in the mobile adversary model, which means that uh, the adversary can target many parties over time. Um, so if we keep the same party is holding the secret at all time, then eventually the adversary will get them all. Uh, and for that, uh, to mitigate that problem, we refresh the shares periodically. Uh, and every day, let's say, we do a share refresh protocol where the current committee passes the secret to the next committee. And this way, the adversary needs to corrupt a majority of one committee. It doesn't help it uh, to, co to corrupt some nodes today and others tomorrow. Uh, what we need is that the, the secret will remain hidden if honest majority in each steps, even if different parties are compromised in different times. And since the 90s, there have been a lot of work on how to do proactive secret sharing. Uh, and in our case, the, we would need to combine this with the mechanism that I described earlier for choosing the secret committee. So uh, the secret would be shared among small committee, as we said, and every time period, which could be a minute, an hour, a day, or whatever, we're going to run this resharing, refreshing protocol. 
And it would have these two steps where the first step, a nominating committee will self-select, establish target anonymous channels to the new random secret sharing committee. And then once these channels are established, the old committee will use them to pass the secret to the new one uh, over these things, over these channels by, as I said, uh, encrypting them with the ephemeral public keys uh, and broadcasting the result. Uh, how do you pass this, uh, this uh, secret from one committee to the other? So in that work, we described the Yossi style share refresh protocol. The protocol is fairly standard. I mean, it's a new protocol, uh, but it uses standard techniques. Um, you just um, reshare your secret and then uh, um, other members of the members of the new committee gets many shares of shares and combine them in some linear fashion to form their share. Uh, all of that is fairly standard. Uh, each member of the old committee broadcasts a single message with secrets that are encrypted under the keys of those target anonymous channels uh, and includes also zero knowledge proofs that he did the resharing correctly. So the thing that I'm proving here is that the ciphertext that I sent in this message are consistent with the ciphertext that I received in the previous message. And here the statement and the witnesses are short. Uh, and short here mean in size, which is linear in the size of the committee, as opposed to uh, linear in the size of the entire universe of nodes. So this thing will remain uh, just as uh, cheap or, or expensive, uh, no matter how many nodes we have in the system. It just depends on how many nodes we have on the committees. Uh, okay, so what do we have so far? So we got this scalable proactive secret sharing protocol, which is Yoso style. Uh, this protocol is secure under the assumption that this mobile adversary controls less than 0.29 of the nodes at any given time. Uh, in terms of the cryptographic techniques that we use, well, we, re we need anonymous public key encryption. And actually, we need both secrecy and anonymity to be maintained uh, under an adaptive adversary. And there is a related open problem regarding constructing uh, public key encryptions that uh, remain anonymous under um, adaptive adversary under selective openings. And the TCC paper that we uh, had, had some partial progress towards uh, resolving that thing, but there's still an open problem there, which is interesting because in this respect, the secrecy and the anonymity uh, properties of the public encryption behave very differently. Uh, this solution can considerably made practical because the only thing that uh, is used there are uh, encryptions and near and zero knowledge proofs for sort of proofs of encryption, proof of decryption, proof of linear uh, um, uh, subspaces, and such things like that. And you can implement it based on factor in discrete log, lattice space assumption, etc. So we didn't use any heavy tools like obfuscation or not even snarks. Okay, so with this under our belt, let's look at doing things other than just keeping the secret. In particular, our end goal is to be able to compute on secrets, not just keeping them. Um, so suppose the old committee has two secrets, S1 and S2. We want the committee to be able to pass the product or the sum to the next committee as opposed to the two individual. And if we can do that, then we can compute arbitrary functions on secret data uh, that was posted even by multiple clients. And this is exactly the trusted party solution that we wanted to implement. Uh, and in this newer work that we did uh, fairly recently, we described a new Yoso style protocols uh, for doing that. Some of these protocols use standard techniques, others are more challenging. In particular, I'm not gonna describe it, but if you try to think of how to do information theoretic uh, protocols in this thing, uh, it's very unclear that that's possible at all, and we show that actually it is possible. So some of it is a little more sophisticated, uh, some of it is, is fairly straightforward uh, in, uh, extension of the secret sharing. I'm not going to talk about the protocol. There is one aspect that I want to talk about, uh, and it was implied in everything that I said so far, but I want to make it very explicit because 
we believe that designing protocols like that is important and making this distinction is very important in being able to work on that um, and, and make progress. So these pro the protocols that I described, for example, the secret sharing protocol has these two orthogonal components. Uh, there is this problem of assigning the nodes to the roles of committee members. And then there is the, the executing the protocol between the committees where you pass the shares. And these two aspects can be addressed se uh, separately. And in particular, you can ask about resilience and how, what's the, what, uh, how many corrupted parties this can uh, withstand. You can ask about resilience of both of these components separately. So the role assignment that I described so far is wasteful in resilience in the sense that uh, if you have uh, a fraction of bad nodes overall, then you get roughly two F fraction of bad committee members. So the role assignment was wasteful, but the protocol for passing the secret uh, still has maximum resiliency. As long as uh, you have honest majority in the committees, then the secrecy and correctness still hold. So you can, you can work on research, make advances in each one of these components separately, uh, and they're very, very separate. They're actually orthogonal. You can just plug and play which role assignment uh, protocol you want to use and which protocol you, you want to use on top of that role assignment. Um, and in that recent work, we sort of formalized it by set up a formal model for studying just the protocol aspect, irrespective of the role assignment. So we assume that there is some role assignment, and now that we have it, let's build a protocol on it. So the protocol studies protocol that are executed by roles, and roles are just the names that we gave to these parties that are ephemeral and only speak once. So notice that you know the fifth member of the third committee is a role like that. It's a role, it comes into existence where when the previous committee send them their uh, data, then it computes, it finishes everything it needs to do, and then it broadcasts its message and it's disappeared. So these are the kind of roles that we study. Uh, we put up a formal model for uh, uh, abstraction this, of these things so that we don't need to think about keys and communication and everything like this. And we show some maximally resilience protocol uh, that you can do for any functions. There's a proof of concept protocol with information theoretic security and a more efficient protocol with computational security. Um, and again, these protocols, some of them are more interesting than the, than the other, but the thing that's really interesting there is the ability to abstract it out and study them in isolation. Uh, one interesting thing about this model is it's probably uh, interesting even if you don't care about blockchains at all, um, in the sense that these ephemeral speak once roles seems like a good match for serverless computing in the cloud. Serverless computing is this, um, you know, very popular um, architecture these days, and it exactly has this flavor of, you know, a role comes into existence when it's needed, it does its job, it returns the output, and it disappears. Uh, so if you want to do secure computation in the serviceless way, and you have a way of instantiating the roles, uh, then these protocols are for you. And very recently, there is work of Chiduri uh, et al. that describes some weaker version of it uh, in the context of volunteer-based computation, where you know, somebody volunteered to assume some role and then finishes the role and goes home. Okay, so what we have so far is uh, this model of YOSO protocols. Protocols that are implemented over this model that can be maximally efficient, and then the solution that I described at the beginning of this talk of how to assign uh, roles, uh, parties to roles, that's somewhat defective in the sense that, uh, you know, it's wasteful in terms of the resilience. Uh, again, the problem, if you recall, is that the adversary gets to double dip if, the, if we have this nomination and nominees, and if the nominator is bad, then so is the nominee. If the nominator is good, then the nominee is just a random member who's also bad with some probability. So how do we do better than that? I want to now improve the role assignment so that it is also maximally resilient or close to it. And the very natural thing to do now that we can compute on uh, 
uh, in the COSO model is just instead of having individual nominators, uh, let's make the previous committees be the nominators. Previous committees have honest majority in them, so they can act as they will. They can act as a trusted uh, good party. So let them be the nomination uh, instead of computing that individually. And this way, uh, we can get our resilience there. So that's a, a nice idea. Uh, here is how it would work, perhaps. So we have this nomination function, which is a function that takes uh, all the public keys of everybody, and big and public keys, and some randomness. And what it outputs is this ephemeral uh, public key and an encryption of the corresponding ephemeral secret key under one of these keys. And the index of the key is chosen at random. So this is a randomized function that we want to implement. And what we're saying now is instead of having each individual nominator do that, let's make the previous committee compute this function, Yosu style. Uh, and as, as I said, the all are majority, so they complete it honestly, uh, and the adversary will not get this double dipping. Uh, so that's nice, that's a nice idea, it just doesn't quite work because it's not efficient enough. And the reason it's not efficient enough is that this function, this nomination function that we're trying to compute has a very long input. The input of this function is everybody's public key, which is linear in N, so the computation is expensive and not scalable. Uh, it grows with the uh, size of the system, and this is not acceptable to us. So to do better, we are going to use the, this tool of private information retrieval. Let me just um, quickly uh, say what this thing is. A private information retrieval is just a client-server protocol where the server holds an N element array that's typically called a database and the clients hold an index and the client wishes to retrieve one element from that database without the server learning anything about which index was retrieved. And a private information retrieval protocol is non-trivial if the server sends a lot less than N elements to the client. And there are known private information retrieval protocols with uh, or of log and communication, uh, but the server work is always linear in the number of uh, elements in the database. And the reason for that is if the server doesn't touch one of these elements during the computation, then the server knows that that element was not the one accessed. So inherently the server has to do exactly, uh, at least in computation. Uh, so this is the tool that we use and how do we wanna use it? Um, so we can break the nomination function into first function F1 that takes all the public keys and some randomness and outputs a randomly chosen public key. And then the second one that takes this randomly chosen public key and some extra randomness and just uh, chooses the ephemeral public and secret key and encrypting the secret key under the chosen public key. Now F1, we can implement using private information retrieval. The committee as a whole plays the client who chooses the random index and does whatever the client does to get it. Um, and each committee member separately in its head can play the server because you know the database here is just all the public keys of everybody. So everybody can play the server them themselves. Uh, so F1, you can do with very little communication. And F2, well, F2 is a small function. I mean, it only, the, the, it only depends, the input of F2 only depends on the security parameter uh, in its length, so you can compute it efficiently. Uh, and that doesn't grow with the number of parties in the system. So you combine the two, you get a scalable nomination where the work that each individual party will do will grow linearly with the size of the system because I'm playing the server but the communication does not. And that's the more expensive resource here. So when we put everything together, we get the following theorem. For every multi-party functions and any constant epsilon, strictly greater than a half, there is a scalable protocol for security computing F in an N node network with a broadcast channel uh, that's, resil that's secure as long as the adversary controls at most a fraction of half minus epsilon. 
uh, and each step has communication, which is much smaller than that. Uh, so in other words, a public blockchain can be a trusted party and we can have uh, a, tra a scalable implementation uh, of secure computation in this environment, even in the setting where the adversary is adaptive, even in the setting that you only use the broadcast uh, for communication, even in that setting. Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, there are a lot of open problems and future work uh, here. Uh, the most obvious of them is so far it's all on paper. Uh, we have started looking into what would it take to actually implement it. Uh, you know, the, you need to uh, pick the primitive, you need to implement the various sub protocols, etc. Uh, there's a lot of choices and a lot of, uh, you know, optimizations that can be had. Uh, there's a lot of theory and modeling questions as well. Uh, I mentioned before some problem about anonymous public encryption uh, with selective opening. And the question there is if you take anonymous public encryption that's secure against static corruptions, uh, would it still, the same uh, uh, construction also be secure against selective opening? We suspect that the answer is yes. We proved it for a special case, uh, but we don't know the answer. Um, everything that I said so far, the N nodes, big N nodes, uh, I thought of them as fixed. Those two can change, especially in blockchain, public blockchain nodes come and go. So what happens when they change? Uh, then there is the question that I completely shoved under the rug here, uh, that in a blockchain, not all nodes are created equal. Nodes that have more computing power are weight, uh, have more weight if it's a proof of work. Nodes that are richer are more important if it's a proof of stake. Um, that makes a difference both in terms of how you model things and in terms of the weights of nodes change over time. So if I send some of my coins to somebody else in a proof of stake, then now that other person is more important and I'm less important. Uh, what happens here, not clear. There are a lot of open questions there and many others. So with that, uh, I'm done and I'll be happy to take questions. Um, thank you very much, Sai, for the very interesting talk. Um, I have some questions, but I'll first ask the audience. Are there any questions, anyone? Uh, if you have any questions, you can type it in the Q&A, or if you're a panelist, you can just speak up. Um, let, let, let me start and then maybe in the meanwhile, the others will make up their mind. Uh, so when, when you talked about the, like the committee members, the majority of the committee members being honest, does that mean that like all the time the majority is honest or most of the times the majority is honest? In our case, we need the majority to be honest all the time because every step of the way, there's going to be a committee that sort of represents the entire population that holds the secret. So if at any time the adversary gets to corrupt a majority, then the adversary will learn the secret and from then, then on you're dead. Uh, of course, if you're going to use it in any realistic system, you're going to have to have some mechanisms so that reveal of the secret is not catastrophic. Those mechanisms would probably have to go outside the model, either use an actual offline trusted party or some fallback on some other systems to, uh, to help you recover or something like that. Mm -hmm. But for this, is it still sufficient to have f smaller than like 0.29 to have like always majority of the committee members on us? Yes, I mean, yes. So, or even if you use the, the newer work, even, you know, anything less than, than strictly less than a half. Um, the thing is, let's suppose that you have 45%, you know, the cap mm -hmm. of the core up to this 45%, you need to make your committees large enough so that with churn of bound, the probability that the committee will ever be uh, mostly corrupted is, uh, is negligible. And since it happens in, happens in every steps, then you can run it for polynomially many steps and still be negligible. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, there is a question in the Q&A. Do you want to have a look? I can, I can, I can read it. Uh, how yeah. the proposed method can be related to edge computing that lo location awareness and other factors such as latency might be important selection of the committee? Is it still working? Uh, good question, and I don't see how it can work because, um, you know, if I'm a member of the committee, I have to remain anonymous, so the committee can't take my location into consideration. I guess, in principle, it might be possible to encrypt also, if, if there is some database uh, of the location of all the nodes, then you can think of this database as part of your PKI and then take that as part in, into consideration when you choose the, nomin the sort of the next committee. So I guess theoretically it's possible, assuming that the location information of all the nodes is fixed and, and known to everybody. Um, so yeah, I get, okay, I guess the theoretic, okay, I guess the answer is theoretically it's possible. It's very hard for me to think of how you do that uh, in, uh, in practice because, for example, things like the private information retrieval solution that I described, it's good when you want to choose uh, just a random index. If you want to choose an index with, you know, advantage to some of the clients over other, it's going to be, become very inefficient very quickly. Uh, who computes F1 and F2 in the third? Okay, so that's a, that's a good point. And, and let me go back to that slide if I can to here. Um, you have the previous committees compute those functions using a secure computation protocol. So this solution is sort of a, boot, a, a continuous bootstrapping type of things where the last, I don't know, 15 committees are doing steps to select the next committee. So if I'm on a committee, I'm doing some work to do the actual work and some work to select the committee in, 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 uh, in round 15 from to now and some work to select the committee in round 14 from now and 13 and one and, and two. So I, I take a little bit of step for with every step of the committee selection protocol so that by the time the next round rolls in, the work of my committee and the 14 committees that precede me already done to choose the next committee that we'll need to do and then it will do its step. So it's always the committee that does this work. It's never an individual member of those committees. Um, I'm wondering what if we can use ring signatures playing the role of anonymous public encryption. So I don't know how because the issue here is really to hiding stuff. I want to generate these um, these uh, channels that people can send encrypted message on. So, or, or in this case, in the, the public, the anonymous public encryption. I want to sort of convey a secret key to uh, somebody. Um, okay, good question. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I def definitely don't see off the top of my head how to use any kind of any kind of things that's not an encryption based. I mean, it, it's possible that you can do you can use things like identity based encryption things, but. In my mind, at least, there has to be some encryption in it. Signatures is, is not, not the right tool for the job because you really need to convey some secret information. But, you know, it's just a very vague intuition. So maybe I'm just missing something here. Yeah, I think related to this, when you, for example, mentioned about like uh, proving that you actually you are using one of the public keys in the anonymous PKE encryption, I think there maybe you can use some kind of like a one out of n proof, which is kind of like a ring signature in essence. But yeah, as you mentioned, this would be this may be yeah, costly possibly. because n, if that this is like the whole number of users, this can be millions or maybe even more. Okay. 
Uh, how is randomness selected? So I, I guess the answer is still on the same slide that I'm showing now, where the randomness is part of the input. And in this case, I mean, a, a common way of doing it is that every committee member contributes its own randomness that it shows by itself. And then the randomness of the function is taken to be, for example, the sum of all the randomnesses or something like that. So that if any of the committee members are honest, then this randomness is really random. That's, uh, that's sort of a common way of doing it. If, so in theory, that works, what I just said. In practice, if you want to use it, uh, I didn't think about how to do that in practice. I mean, the, for the private information retrieval, I did think about it a little bit. And it works more or less in, along this way with every committee member uh, just encrypts an index. And the index that you get is just the sum of all the indexes modulo the number of players. Uh, for the other part of the ephemeral random, the randomness for the ephemeral keys, I don't know. I mean, this, uh, I'm sure there are many optimizations to be had there. Uh, maybe you're using peer. Could F1 be broken down to smaller sub F functions for achieving parallel computing? Well, there is an obvious way of, of making it uh, parallelizable in that you don't need to choose a single public key. You need to choose little n public keys because you need to choose one for every member of the future committee. So you have to uh, use, you have to actually run a multi-index peer protocol where uh, you choose n indexes, not just one. And this is sort of obviously parallelizable uh, within a single peer Unless the peer scheme itself is parallelizable, which many peer schemes are, then I don't see how to do that. So if you can parallelize the individual peer scheme, then yes, but breaking it at the level of abstraction of a peer, I don't see how. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, this seems to be most of the questions. I just have another quick question. Uh, I have a question, Mohammed. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I mean, yeah, go ahead. Uh, all right. First of all, thank you uh, for the great talk. Um, so I, I am interested in, in knowing a little bit more about the selective opening anonymous uh, PKE that you mentioned, that you, you made um, a little bit of progress in. So is it, is it in the sim simulation, uh, I mean, in the simulated version of the selective opening, or is it the indistinguishability version? It's and and what, are the, what are those like special occasions that you could solve the problem? Uh, all right, thank you for asking. <laughs> if, how much time do I have? Do I have any time? Uh, if you are free, you can. Uh, okay, I can, I can, I can, I can talk for a couple. This is just like two slides or something. So, yeah, yeah. Would... Um, so the, yeah. So we want to. Um, um, right, we, we have this setting where we have a lot of public keys and very few ciphertexts. And these ciphertexts were encrypted under some of the keys. And the question we ask here is, can an adversary that corrupts only a, a fraction of the keys nonetheless hit a lot more than a fraction of the keys that were actually used, even though they are hidden? And you can ask this question uh, for an adaptive adversary that sees the keys in the ciphertext and, and then open the keys. Uh, and you can ask it to, to, a, to an adversary that's a little less adaptive in the sense that it still sees all the keys in ciphertext and then it opens all the keys at once instead of opening one key at a time. Um, and in the context of secrecy, we know that both things, I mean, sec uh, secrecy, re regular secrecy doesn't imply secrecy. Uh, in either case, uh, but in the case of anonymity, we show that for the semi-adaptive thing, the one that, on, that needs to open all of them at once, if you, if you have a public key encryption that's uh, um, anonymous, then it's also anonymous under selective opening for a semi-adaptive adversary. Uh, so if you can open only a fraction of the overall, then you cannot uh, open a whole lot more than a fraction of the important keys, except with negligible probability. And we conjecture that the same holds for truly adaptive adversary. So that's, um, that's basic, this is basic information. So it's, I think in, in spirit, it's more, it's more game-based than, uh, than, simu than simulation, because what we're thinking of is a very specific property 
This is the property of opening many of the important keys. Uh, so in that way, it's, uh, it's more game-based, even though, of course, when you come to, uh, to um, when, when you come to uh, actually prove it, there is a simulator in, in the proof itself. So. Okay, so it's, it's kind of a com combination of both. And the catch is this semi-adaptive rather than... Uh... So it, this is just how we were able to prove it. And it's not because I think that there is a big difference between the two. It's just that the combinatorics of the game that you get for a fully adaptive is complicated and we're not able to prove it. We have a reduction that we believe works, but the, you know, we were not able to analyze it. Okay. That's basically what it is. All right, thank you. Uh, you mentioned the proposed model might be good for serverless computing. Can you please elaborate a bit more how functions are getting the public? That's exactly the point. I mean, in, in serverless computing, the way it's typically uh, practiced, there is the cloud I don't know, Amazon Cloud, and Amazon is in charge of, you know, assigning your requests to that server. So I believe, I didn't think about it, but I believe that you will have to assume some trusted, more or less trusted way of assigning keys to uh, provisioning the new parties with keys. And if you have that, then you can compute arbitrary functions. So you, I guess you reduce your trust from computing to just key management, which is something. Okay, um, thank you very much, everyone and Shai. Uh, I think we need to conclude our session here today. Uh, just okay, um, thank you again very much, Shai, for your thank very- you informative and uh, interesting talk and thank you everyone for attending so if you are interested to hear about our seminar series you can email us and you can also subscribe to the mailing list and hope to see you all in the next talk thank you thank you